All right, so let's start with what alkanes are, where do we get them? So the primary source of hydrocarbons, and that's a term we should know what it is. Hydrocarbons, as you know in, from O levels, it is atoms or compounds with hydrogen and carbon only. So that's hydrocarbons. And first homologous series in them, that is alkanes. And uh, what alkanes do is that we get them all, just like many other hydrocarbons, from crude oil and natural gas. So two main sources of uh, hydrocarbons are crude oil and natural gas. And uh, you remember from O levels again that you always get A, H, O, and C. Every hydrogen atom has to have one bond, oxygen two, nitrogen three, carbon four. And in this case, carbon will have four bonds with totally different atoms. Now, they can be similar atoms like two hydrogens, three hydrogens, four hydrogens, whole But more importantly, what this means is that carbon, because of having four bonds with different atoms, will have a tetrahedral shape. So in alkanes, the chain will always have a tetrahedral shape. So if you have uh, three carbons, so for example, propane ki agar mein baat karta hon, so ye carbon hoga to iske paas aise char honge, aur phir ye carbon hoga to iske paas aise char honge, aur phir ek aur hoga to uske paas aise is tarah ke char honge. So that's how the chain goes. Okay, you have hydrogens all uh, filling them up, but the rest of it is just there. Because they're hydrocarbons, they're non-polar. Okay, so they're non-polar. Uh, the reason for that is because there's very, very small difference in electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen, which means that they have London dispersion forces mainly. Okay, that's the intermolecular force of attraction that they have or van der Waal forces that they have, which basically means that they are going to be volatile. They're going to have relatively low melting and boiling point. Okay, which is why the first four, methane, ethane, propane, butane, they're all uh, gases at room temperature. And then they're also going to be insoluble in water. Why? Because again, they will not be able to form hydrogen bond with water. But this also means that as the chain grows, there's going to be stronger intermolecular force because there's going to be more electrons in the cloud, which means melting and boiling point is going to increase. And that's a trend that we see, that initially the forces are weaker, but as you grow in the series, the molecule starts to have stronger forces so it becomes less volatile, it has a higher melting point, it increasingly becomes insoluble, and its viscosity, density, melting, boiling point, volatility, vapor pressure, they all have these trends. So as the chain grows, you're going to get more electrons, right? So melting boiling point, density, and viscosity, they're all going to increase. But volatility, and vapor pressure is going to decrease. Why? Because it's not going to be as volatile as before because the forces are stronger, it's not going to be able to evaporate with less energy. All right, so they're all related to each other. And of course, they're so, this is all related to the strength of London dispersion forces that have. Now, here's one more thing. As the number of branches grows, then this has an opposite. That's important. Now, if you have an isomer, for example, uh, butane glylitha, I have this compound and I have an isomer of this compound. This is a branch, right? More branches are there, less the surface area that is exposed. Because they can, in this one, this is all that is exposed to the surroundings. And this is all the places where van der Waal forces can interact. But over here, this has been reduced, which is why this will have lesser surface area. Less surface area means less points for van der Waals forces, which means the melting point of unbranched is higher and melting point of the branch one is lower. It's going to say that more branches make the molecule spherical, reducing the exposed surface area. So obviously surface area is less exposed. The strength of Van der Waal force is affected because of that. Okay. 
so melting point decreases and so do a number of other things so if you have more like branches then you're basically packing it more strongly and all that so uski wajah se ye ho jayega all right so for example you know this compound and what if i had when decreases yeah it decreases because you have less surface area exposed so in these two one is hexane and the other is a uh, 23 dimethyl butane which one do you think will have higher boiling point sir the first one the first one yes because it's unbranched and the other one is branched so because of that reason it will have lesser surface area lesser surface area means lesser strength of van der waals forces and yeah now there are three chemical properties which are important for alkenes the first one is actually important for all organic compounds that's combustion all organic compounds go undergo this gaadi jalti hai kyun gaadi mein to organic compound nahi hote hain chahiye gaadi mein kahan pe organic compound hote hain metal se bani hoti hai think about it gaadi mein kahan pe organic compound hai fuel the fuel, fuel sure but fuel fuel we added to burn but the whole bollywood industry is based on this idea that cars will burn and explode so what is there in a car to burn and explode apart from the fuel you know the seats and the panels every insides of the door wherever you see this plastic or this plush material even leather they are all organic compound more than 40% of a modern car is organic steering wheel it's organic metal to bahut kam use karte hain hum we use these polymers which are strong light easy to handle good surface sara kuch so we use them all the time anyway so organic compounds burn straight forward kya hoga let me let's take the example of uh, c3h8 okay so it will get oxygen it will convert to carbon dioxide and water fair enough and uh, you can balance this three carbon dioxide eight hydrogen so four water giving me 10 oxygen on the right two on the left so 10 over 2 that's right but if i don't have sufficient oxygen then this same thing will burn with less oxygen producing carbon monoxide and water water is still there and now i will need less oxygen because uh, three carbon monoxide four water that is seven seven over two oxygen molecules are used 3.5 water mo oxygen molecules now you can argue that wait a minute where will i get a half a molecule but this doesn't have to mean half a molecule it could also mean half a mole or half a billion molecules and that's fine and you could also burn this if you have really if you're running really low on oxygen and you will produce this thing water is still made up and there's three carbon so you're just using two oxygen so as you can see not only is oxygen being used less but this is also becoming less exothermic which basically means that you could have gotten a lot more heat or energy out of these bonds but because you did not have enough oxygen your fuel has basically just went to waste and that is what happens in inefficient uh, engines or engines with not enough ventilation or the faulty uh, air supply so what happens is that basically the bonds are broken but if they were to make carbon dioxide more bonds will be made of very strong energy they'll release more bonds you know bond making is exothermic so as less and less bonds are made in the burning process less and less heat energy is given out okay uh in a uh, uh, as a rule if you have more uh bigger molecule if you have like uh, for example if i compared natural gas which is mainly ch4 to good quality petrol which is mainly uh octane or with the uh, diesel which is uh, this thing then you can clearly see that this is much smaller molecule that is a bigger molecule and then last one is much bigger which means that they'll burn and they will also be uh, they will also give more energy so as you burn this thing more exothermic then why don't we use it why don't we just put diesel in our car engine and uh, use them at higher speeds cars will run faster right they should why doesn't that happen why is it that if you put a diesel engine in 
a diesel in a car engine, in a petrol engine, the car is pretty much lost and you will be sent out of your home. Why is that the case? Why Why can't a petrol engine use diesel? Sir, maybe it needs like much more oxygen. Sure. Pankhalagadu. What do you need to supply before a reaction happens? Activation energy. Act activation energy. A small car engine is not able to provide that activation, which is why petrol may, petrol engine may, diesel dal de, wo burn hi kar sakta us, tod hi nahi sakta us molecule ko. It doesn't have enough energy to break it. Similarly, if you use methane, which is a very small molecule, you can't use it to run your cars because uh, it doesn't supply enough energy for the car engine to move. Sure, there are ways to use it. For example, a few years back, I don't know if you remember or not, but a few years back, it was very popular uh, that you could use CNG kits and you could install them in your cars and they will work and the car will work. Sure, not to very high speed, but it was good enough to save a lot of money on fuel cost and also to make a car go around the city and all that. And the only reason it worked was because that kit was able to burn more methane at the same time so that overall energy that was given out was able to compensate for the petrol being burned. So, but we all know motor vehicles have a problem. They are the main source of pollutants that we have. You burn petrol, you burn diesel. Diesel the khas thaw. It is very dangerous for the environment. Why? Number one, this thing right here, you don't have enough oxygen. People don't take care of their cars. People don't clean out their air filters. And people don't allow the fuel to burn completely. Ek to ye baat hogi, that there is not enough, fuel is not being burnt efficiently. You're churning out carbon monoxide and carbon to the environment. Carbon monoxide, kya karegi? it will damage lungs of people. It will cause blood cancer. It will poison people. And carbon? Carbon is soot, this black carbon. Jo, jo bhi gaadi ka kala hai, that shows it is undergoing incomplete combustion because it's releasing pure carbon out. That carbon is no good. Not for the environment, not for the car. Okay. Second, the fuel that we get, especially in a country like ours, Pakistan, uh, it's a very low quality fuel. Okay. And it will have impurities. Impurities, some impurities are obviously there because uh, it wasn't refined properly because uh, obviously refining fuel costs a lot of money. The fuel prices go up. And Pakistan doesn't want to spend all that. So we buy the cheapest quality fuel that we get. And not just that, it's also that some impurities are added to make up for that loss. For example, a few years back, people were adding lead to fuel. And that lead was supposed to make up for the low quality of it. Because here's what happens. If you, if you have fuel and it's not of uniform quantity, for example, uh, you have petrol and that petrol has molecules of six carbons or molecules of seven carbons or eight carbons and all that you have a mixture of these differently sized molecules then what happens is that the car engine will do will produce these noises which we call knocking because there are few molecules giving a different amount of energy few molecules giving a totally different amount of energy those give us a uniform burning those give us a engine we but that the engine starts protesting so what people would do is people would add lead to the uh, fuel or usse wo awaz nahi nikalti thi because lead was a heavy molecule wo a heavy atom wo usko compensate kar deta tha and people were like good yaar meri gaadi bahut achhi chal rahi only the it turns out that that lead uh, the fumes that it went out they started damaging uh, they were causing brain damage which obviously Pakistan didn't notice for a long time because we were like, it's normal. Hai. But uh, yeah, there was brain damage, especially for young children who are very susceptible to these uh, harmful effects. And secondly, uh, lead was poisoning the catalytic converter. We have spent, we have talked about catalytic converter and what it does to nitrogen and nitrogen oxides and all that. So catalytic converter is something that we actually need in our cars to make them safer for the environment. And this lead was making a coating 
on the con catalyst in there, which means that how does a catalyst work? We know that a catalyst works through heterogeneous catalyst in, in fact. So it basically does adsorption. So what happens is that, for example, nitrogen molecule comes here, gets adsorbed, and uh, hydrogen molecule comes here, gets adsorbed itself, and then they form these bonds, and then it's able to go do that. But when you have a layer of lead here, then there is no absorption happening. So obviously, the job of catalytic converter is lost. It's not working anymore. So that's what happened when people added lead to the fuel. That is why when you go to petrol stations now, you will see they will mention the petrol is unleaded. So it's unleaded. By the way, there's a theory that lead was responsible for, partly responsible for decline of Roman Empire. Do you know the symbol for lead? What's the symbol for lead? PB. PB. Okay. What do we call the guy who come, who fixes the sanitary pipes and all that? Plumber. The old name of lead is plumbum. Basically, Romans, uh, obviously, only they afforded bathrooms in their houses and all that. So they used lead pipes because lead is very dense, lead is easy, lead is long lasting. So they use these lead pipes in their houses, pani transfer ke liye and all that. And the theory says that basically over time, lead was added to the, few, the water that they used for cooking, for eating, for drinking from those pipes. And it caused irreversible brain damage over generations that led to them making bad decisions and obviously the downfall of Roman Empire. I don't know how true that is, but yeah, that's where we get plumber word from. Anyway, so we've talked about catalytic converters and uh, so there's three categories of pollutants. There's carbon monoxide, which combines with hemoglobin causes blood cancer. There's nitrogen oxides, which cause acid rain and acid rain can also cause breathing problems and lung cancer and all that. And uh, then we have hydrocarbons, unburned fuel that is sent out, and they are carcinogenic. Carcinogenic is a term we use for things that are uh, cancer-causing. So that's also something that happens. Also, they also react with ozone, or usse jo hamare paas fumes bante, they are going to be causing smoke and also more harmful pollutants, which we detail not need detail. So catalytic converter allows us to reverse all of that before it even happens. The second most important thing that uh, these cars are responsible for is uh, greenhouse effect. Now, greenhouse effect is good for the environment. In fact, greenhouse effect is the reason life exists. Uh, you know, uh, there are stars out in the space, but space is ridiculously cold. It's actually really, really cold. And the only things that are warm enough to sustain life are planets, especially the planets with atmosphere on them. And the reason that happens is because, you know, heat is not about uh, it being transferred, like conduction, convection, and radiation. That's just how heat is transferred. But something being hot or something being cold is all about how much heat energy it actually stores. So heat is more like storage of energy. In this space, there's not enough particles to store that energy to a good degree. And that is why space is cold. But these planets and the atmosphere that they have, they are able to hold on to that heat. And the particles in the atmosphere trap that heat. And that is why they are able to be warm. And we need the environment to be a certain degree of warm to sustain life, right? So. Without greenhouse effect, there won't be any life. What happens is, that, for example, we have Earth. Pehli baat hai, Earth is such a small planet that a lot, majority of the sun's heat is not even reaching us because it's a really small planet. And then, of the thing, of the radiation that comes up, comes to us, conduction, convection, the whole thing is because there's no particles. But the rest of it that actually comes to us, uh, most of it is just reflected back into the space. Uh, we have polar ice caps, they are white, white reflects, right? So they just reflect it. And uh, then there's also the ionosphere and the others, 
spheres that we have in the atmosphere they just send it out they don't let it come in so ozone is playing a role there and then there is some that is absorbed by the gases in the air there are gases like carbon dioxide or water vapor that absorb that heat and then half of it reaches the surface so thank god because the surface of the earth is uh, much cooler than the surface of the sun so that's good that's good for us because we are not getting a lot of heat energy and we are absorbing some of it and that sustains life that's good that's greenhouse effect but then what we do is we do an enhanced greenhouse effect number one we are producing components we are producing things molecules that are able to hold on to that heat from the sun much longer than the ones that were naturally present so normally you have carbon dioxide a certain percentage of that oxygen nitrogen they all store heat to a certain extent there is water vapor there is water cycle going on they all store heat to a certain extent and obviously the reflection of that radiation is also happening because of ice caps what we did was that we produced hydrocarbons that went out now that hydrocarbons you can argue ke wo to purane animals hi hai na wo to purane plants hi hai that we're burning right coal oil all natural gas they were here and the energy that they're giving out is also the energy that they got from the sun when they were alive sure but the energy that was there when they were alive is ancient energy and the energy that we're getting from the sun right now is the current energy and what we have done is we have gotten both of those abhi sun jitni energy de raha hai that's fine that's good enough for us but we have taken that ancient energy that sun gave billions of millions of years ago aur humne wo bhi utha ke bind nikal diye sari ki sari so that's human activity that's industrial revolution हमने ग्रीन वो सारी एनर्जी उठा के हार्नेस करना शुरू कर दी गुड नाउ वी आर रिलीजिंग मोर गैसेस दैट आर स्टोरिंग हीट फॉर लॉन्गर टाइम एंड वी आर आल्सो रिलीजिंग मोर एनर्जी दैट अर्थ वाज इन यूज्ड टू गेटिंग एट द सेम टाइम उस टाइम पे थी गुड इस टाइम वाली भी ठीक थी कट्ठी कर दी हमने नुकसान कर दिया सेकेंड दिस क्रिएटेड एन इनहैश ग्रीन ऑफ इफेक्ट There's a lot of water vapor, or us water vapor ki wajah se, or carbon dioxide ki wajah se, ya hydrocarbons ki wajah se, which are in the atmosphere, the ice caps started to melt. And once once those ice caps are gone, then there is very little reflection back to the atmosphere, right? So when there is very little reflection, what happens? The water in the sea starts to absorb the heat that is coming from the sun. अभी हमें 50 परसेंट मिल रही थी 50 परसेंट हम वापिस भेज रहे थे लाइक थर्टी परसेंट हम रिफ्लेक्ट कर रहे थे ट्वेंटी परसेंट गैसेज ले रही थी नाउट अब वो वॉटर सारे का सारा इट विल स्टार्ट टू ऑब्जॉर्ब दैट हीट The 30% heat of the sun that was going back, and what happens when water absorbs a lot of heat? It creates water vapor. And what what does water vapor do? Water vapor does greenhouse effect. It warms up, which causes more water vapor to come out. And not just that, obviously, vapor pressure. Because I say eventually it will reach equilibrium, but the temperature of the environment, the atmosphere will start to increase. So the Earth warms up. more than it would naturally and as that happens what happens climate changes and whenever the climate changes it kills life life is sustainable because of a certain climate certain weather patterns animals plants they're all used to that humans are used to that and while we have the power to maybe withstand temperature effects to some extent ki hum ac chala lenge agar hum uh, फॉर्चुनेट एनफ है अफोर्ड करते हैं या हम सर्दियों में हीटर चला लेंगे एंड बट द कॉस्ट ऑफ ऑल दैट इज गोइंग टू राइज अप बिकॉज मोस्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड इज नॉट एबल टू यूज दैट एंड देर विल बी देर आर डेथ्स बिकॉज ऑफ दिस एवरी ईयर एंड दैट इज वेरी सैड एंड मोस्ट ऑफ इट कैन बी स्टॉप्ड 
most of it can be replaced with the better ways but at the heart of all of this this industrial machinery that we have do you know that i think there is one company china coal that produces 16% of the world pollution like 16% and then there is chevron and enron and these big companies uh, matlab i was reading up on this that abhi peru mein there was this accident in which there was oil spillage and uh, the effects of that oil spillage are on the pollution on the climate on the environment are worse than if 2 billion people were to stop using plastic for their whole lives jo uska impact hai wo 4 din ka jo leakage tha uska zyada impact tha main apni sari umar bahut zyada environment ke ख्याल से जिंदगी गुजारू एक एयर ब्लू की फ्लाइट उस सारे को तबाह कर देती है एंड एट द हार्ट ऑफ इट इज बेसिकली ग्रीड दीज कंपनीज दे डोंट केयर दीज एग्जेक्टिव लाइक के प्रॉफिट इज बॉटम लाइन इज वॉट मैटर्स द मोस्ट इन्वायरमेंट डेव यू वॉच दैट मूवी डोंट लुक अप इट मेक्स अ गुड सटायर ऑफ दैट बट ऑब्वियसली दिस इज नॉट फनी because it leads to rising sea levels floods uh unpredictable weather patterns aur hum jitne marzi catalytic converter laga le hum isko nahi kar sakte manage pe all right that was a very long rant uh, but yeah you need to know what greenhouse effect is why it's important and then you also need to know uh that if we don't control it if we don't manage we can be heading towards disasters all right so that is uh, hydrocarbons or in k impact but there is a reaction of hydrocarbons jo hame dekhna hai and that is actually very interesting reaction we call it substitution reaction okay and substitution reaction of free radicals so we call it free radical substitution which is also called frs okay so what happens in frs uh in all levels we know that if you took ch4 and we added chlorine to it it would convert it to ch3cl with hcl right uh what was a uh, necessary condition for this do you remember uv light uv light very good uv light so we needed uv light and that uv light would uh basically allow this reaction to happen what was happening was that uh hydrogen was displaced by chlorine and we were getting this but this reaction is not as straight forward as we made it look out to be uh, what happens when uv light comes in let's try to look at that there is these bonds of carbon and hydrogen they're very strong bonds 410 kJ per mole very strong bonds ultraviolet light is not able to break this but there is this bond as well and ultraviolet light is able to break this okay so what happens is that when ultraviolet light comes in sabse pehle before even methane does anything because ultraviolet can't do anything with methane this chlorine breaks down into this thing what is this process called does anybody remember half arrows what do they show take fission the fission what kind of fission homolytic heterolytic homolytic homolytic very good so you are going to get two chlorine radicals and that's the first step we call this the initiation step because this is where it starts uh why does chlorine break down and not in because the carbon hydrogen bond is very strong even carbon carbon bond is very strong it is the weakest bond that is broken by uh ultraviolet light and that is chlorine chlorine here chlorine bond is 242 kJ per mole but carbon carbon bond is 350 and carbon hydrogen is 410 so it's really uh easy for ultraviolet to break this bond because it is the weakest you need to spend the least amount of energy and that's what happens here you are going to get chlorine radicals now uh what's going to happen is that this chlorine radical is going to approach the methane molecule that you have all right so in the methane molecule 
what you have is that this is a radical it's going to approach hydrogen okay and it has electron jo ye it will use that electron to entice the hydrogen ki bhai tum idhar aa jao mere sath bond bana lo and hydrogen does that so this chlorine radical this electron ye iske sath half bond banata hai aur hydrogen iske sath half bond banata hai it takes this electron with carbon aur wo uske sath share kar leta hai aur carbon ko apna electron wapas kar deta hai the bond breaks homolytically again and this time we get hcl because hydrogen radical and chlorine radical bond together and they form hcl and what are we left with a ch3 so we just created a methyl radical so yahan pe question ye hai ki why doesn't chlorine bond with carbon why does it bond with hydrogen why not carbon why doesn't it attack carbon and the answer to that is again bond energy of carbon and hydrogen is 413 and bond energy of hcl is 431 but bond energy of carbon chlorine is uh, 338 so here's what happens if carbon hydrogen bond breaks that is 413 joule supplied and if hcl bond is made that is 431 joules released kilojoules that is minus 18 kilojoules the reaction is exothermic per mole so it is possible to do this reaction but let's see if ch bond was to broke break and ccl bond was to make so 413 of that minus 338 of that that will be plus 75 that's an endothermic process which is difficult to do because you have to supply a lot of energy chlorine gas energy will get it so that is why chlorine prefers to do this reaction breaks this bond makes this bond so it's hcl is made this is my step 2 this is called propagate what i've done is i have taken chlorine radical reacted it with hydrogen made the hcl and now this has led to a new uh methyl radical to be born now this methyl radical can do a, a number of different things one possibility is that this methyl radical would go on and react with chlorine molecule so it will do exactly what chlorine did to it it will share this electron with this chlorine sorry half electron and this electron goes back to that chlorine and now we have gotten ch3cl with a chlorine radical and that radical can do the same thing again wapas jayega kisi aur methane molecule ke paas uska phir reaction karega aur phir karega and keeps on going again why does this occur why not something else because of the bonds what's the bond energy of chlorine chlorine 242 what's the bond energy of chlorine carbon 338 when they make this bond it's an exothermic reaction kyun nahi hoga reaction hoga so methyl goes makes a bond with chlorine molecule and there you go that's propagation why propagation because it has created another radical that can go on and make react with another molecule which will create another radical which will go on and react with another molecule and make another and the cycle keeps on going propagation steps create more radicals and those radicals can go and react with other molecules to make even more radicals but the cycle has to come to an end somehow and that is called termination okay so how will it terminate when a radical bonds with another radical what if chlorine radical were to bond with another chlorine radical making cl2 okay what if methyl radical were to bond with another methyl rad because carbon that has the free electrical ch3 will bond with chlorine radical and make ch3cl and that's also a possibility so these are uh terminations because colliding with another radical ends the cycle so overall what happens all you start by creating more radicals in chlorine breaking down into two chlorine radicals those radicals go on 
multiply attack a simple molecule and make another radical in the process that's pro propagation because that new radical will go on and attack another one and then though if the radicals come and collide with each other they form stable molecules and that is termination okay so we can see that this is exactly how the reaction occurs because if we were to draw the energy profile diagram of this process this is what we'll see so we see that uh, there's an activation energy like this there's a dip and there's another activation energy like that so this is a two-step reaction over here i have the ch4 and chlorine molecule that you had and this is the activation energy of that process okay and over here, I have the radical being produced from HCl. And this is the activation energy of that process. And this is where I get CH3Cl plus HCl overall. So overall, this reaction is uh, exothermic, as you can see. That's the delta H. But it has two steps, and those two steps are the ones that are doing this. Clear so far? Any question? Initiation is? In the the in the Sorry, second, go on. Can you explain the second um, activation energy on the diagram? Yeah. I don't understand That's that. a termination step. That's a termination step. Initiation is the first one. Termination is the second one. Now, it doesn't have to just be this. What if basically all of these molecules and radicals are moving around in the same container? So it's not always that a radical collides with a molecule or a radical collides with another radical. Maybe a radical will collide with a molecule that we did not expect it to collide with. For example, once I have a chlorine radical made, what are the chances that it will collide with another chlorine like that? And this, is, this molecule has already done substitution, but it is still in the same mixture. So this chlorine radical is still able to bounce off it and maybe come and collide with it. So what will it do? It will come here, do the whole process, get an HCl, and leave out a CCl radical. And that CCl H2 radical can go on and collide with another chlorine molecule and make dichloromethane. And an uh, sorry, and a chlorine radical. And you're made dichloromethane. That chlorine radical can then maybe collide with this thing again, HCl again, and dichloromethyl radical. And that dichloromethyl radical can collide with a chlorine molecule and make trichloromethane and chlorine radical. And they can collide with each other and make HCl and trichloromethane radical and that can collide with another chlorine molecule and make tetrachloromethane and chlorine radical and that tetrachloromethane could collide with something else and make a totally different thing when you actually do this reaction you get a host of byproducts and the more you allow the reaction to go on the more it continues to form these new and new compounds but eventually they all just die down when they reach termination step. So it's a chain process. That in uh, these two, we are getting dichloromethane, and these two, we're getting trichloromethane, and these two, we're getting tetrachloromethane. But the reaction is nowhere to stop until and unless two radicals collide with each other. For example, these two collide with each other. The reaction will stop. The more radicals there are, the more the reaction goes on. And this is free radical substitution. And this can happen with bromine as well. Try to do free radical substitution of chlorine and ethane and try to come up with as many byproducts as you can. Like I have CH3, CH3, and chlorine gas, and there's ultraviolet light. Go on, complete this. Also, uh, once you're done with that, try to come up with possible outcomes that you could have 
if uh, bromine were to react with the same thing, bromine. Again, ultraviolet. Initiation is when you create radicals, propagation is when radicals create more radicals, and termination is when radicals join to make molecules. All right. 